Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Just when the garden gets going, the bugs arrive. Today we're going to talk about pests of tomato and squash. Also, lilies are a great way to add a pop of color to the garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Frank Hale. Dr. Frank is a UT Extension Etymologist, and Joellen Diamond will be joining us later. Doc, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you yeah, here. This First time here, this yes. is great. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for being here. Let's talk about vegetable pests, all right? Specifically, let's talk about squash pests. Sure, yeah. I brought a squash plant here today okay. just to show you. We often p use transplants, put them into the garden, and guess what? <laughs> the insects are just waiting uh -huh. for these plants, uh -huh. okay? And one thing we often see attacking the leaves are these little cucumber beetles. Yes. So they can smell a squash plant pretty far away, right. and they <laughs> zoom in on it. So many times you'll see the leaves just tattered. So one thing I might suggest, there's a thing called uh, floating row cover mm -hmm. or cheesecloth, something like that. You right. can actually cover tender plants, but still let the light in, but kind of exclude these pests. Okay. And then that way you don't have to use so much insecticide, because otherwise they, they could eat the plants almost to the ground. Wow, because they pretty much what, skeletonize the leaves? Yeah, the part? yeah, they look all skeletonized. You can see right. feeding wow. between the vein or even you know, more feeding than that. Okay, all right. Uh, another thing, once a, uh, you might want to keep the row cover on for a while because we have other pests that we'll get on squash. Uh, squash bugs overwinter around your garden. Uh, a good thing to do is lay down flat boards around the edge of your garden. Lift those boards up in the spring, you'll see the overwintering squash bugs will be there. You can just tap those boards into a bucket of soapy water ah. and get rid of them because they're going to move into the into the garden and start laying their bronze color eggs. Yes. So if you those. see those yeah. eggs, Chris, what do you do with them? Get them off. Yeah, you squish yeah. them with your yeah. uh, forefinger and your thumb and just crush them. <laughs> squash or, them. Or right. tear off the part of the leaf that they're on. Right. Because those are going to uh, give rise to the little nymphs and they're going to be little gray bugs. Okay. And before you know it, you can be covered up with squash bugs. Ow. Another pest we have uh, is called the squash vine borer. It's a clear wing moth borer. It's related to dogwood borers and peach tree borers. Okay. It's a red moth and most moths fly at night. This one flies during the day. It likes the bright sunshine and it's once that squash starts you know trailing out growing a little bit it's going to lay its eggs on the vine. Okay. So until the plant maybe it is just starting to it's going to take a while for the squash plant to start blooming. Up till then keep that floating row cover on it so it doesn't lay an egg because the caterpillar that arises from that egg will tunnel into the vine mm -hmm devour it from the inside, and about the time you have squash producing, the vine might just die. Wow, just collapses. Uh, right. Now when you have yeah. this, uh, try not to put the, the, the row cover over the flowers. Okay. If it starts blooming, you gotta have an entryway for the bees to pollinate it. Okay. Squash bees and other native bees. Okay. Now what if somebody doesn't want to use those means? What do they want to use? I mean, there are insect insecticides. There are insecticides. You could treat with uh, uh, insecticide with imidacloprid in it for the squash, and you could do that right at planting. Wow, and really? that, that totally protects it. Wow. I mean, you can't even see any feeding damage. So, but some people don't want to use that, right, but sure. almost all the commercial squash produced has, has insecticide like that. It's a systemic, it's taken into the plant. And so it won't hurt your lady beetles and other insects that might just land on the plant. Right. As long as they're not feeding, it's not going to hurt them. Okay. And guys, too, for the squash bug, going back to that, practice good sanitation would be something else you would recommend as well? Yeah, cleaning up uh, debris and stuff yeah. around the garden. But uh, putting those boards down, they're going to need a place to overwinter. Fence okay. rows and yeah. pla overgrown places like that. Same for, you know, Colorado potato beetles would do the same thing on potatoes. They move out from the weedy areas back into the garden. Wow. Yeah, so. And these are considered to be the major pests of the squash. Yeah, right? that's, squash that's the, the main thing. Yeah. I think the worst thing, truthfully, has to be that squash vine borer. Because yes. it can kill yes. the whole vine. Yes. So uh, we can use insecticide sprays for that. But it's difficult because you have 
a plant that's blooming at the same time and you really don't want to spray the flowers when a, when a plant's blooming because that could hurt the point. bees. That's a good point. So you have to be very careful and maybe spray the base and up till where, stop where the blooms are. You okay. know, you don't want to spray blooms. Good stuff. Now let's talk about tomato pests. Oh, everybody likes to go tomatoes. Yeah, everybody right? has at least yes. one or two tomatoes, yes. maybe a pepper thrown in there. I brought a tomato plant today. Okay. It's it's going good. When they put those in the ground, sometimes you find them the next day and they've been clipped off. Uh -huh. Now what could do that? It's the cutworm. Cutworm, uh -huh. exactly. Right. Most a lot of these cutworms don't even overwinter here, but they okay. fly up on these spring storm fronts that we have. So the moth is that? Down, lives down south like the black cutworm. Okay. They lay their eggs on weeds and things and then as soon as you start tilling your garden and planting your vegetables, guess what? They're looking for something to eat. <laughs> right. They're nocturnal feeders. Okay. So they're under clumps of dirt in the soil uh, during the uh, daytime. They come out at night okay. and then they clip a plant and pull it back into their underground den to feed on. Wow, that's interesting. So okay. some people will get uh, around the plant, put a, li a little circle with aluminum foil mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that will kind of deter the cutworms a little bit. Okay. Some people organic they might put within that circle they might put diatomaceous earth ah. or something irritating the insect. Okay. Um, so those are some things and then of course we have insecticides sure. that you could spray the so you want to spray the soil around the plant and the base of the plant okay. so that when they walk across the soil at night they pick up the insecticide. Okay, how about that? Yeah. And what about aphids? Yeah, yeah aphids, uh, they, they can fly. Some aphids <laughs> fly and the, they'll move in from wild host plants, weeds and such. Mm -hmm. They'll land on usually the terminal of the plant, these new tender leaves. And aphids can give rise to other aphids very quickly. Mm -hmm. The female can either lay eggs or she can give rise to uh, a live young, wow. so live birth. So you have lots of aphids very quick. Their life cycle is very fast. Okay. And, and so you can start out with just a few wing forms that come in, they start laying eggs or giving birth, and then you have lots of aphids. <laughs> so I like to, if I see aphids on a plant and I haven't put it in the ground, I take it, lay it on its side, and wash it down with soapy water. Okay. With a hose, a really right. strong jet of ho uh, water, okay. so you just blast the aphids off. And you could really do that still when they're in the garden. If you see a tomato plant in the morning, just blast the top of it, you see some aphids, and just physically remove them. Okay. And then let the lady beetles and uh -huh. other predators. So a lot of people, they want to do the first thing is use an insecticide. Yes. But I say caution with aphids because if you just wait a couple weeks, lady beetles will lay their eggs there, their lemon yellow eggs. Mm -hmm. They lay them on the leaves amongst the aphids. There's also a type fly called surfid flies yeah. or hover flies. They'll lay a single white egg right there where the aphids are and the larva is predaceous. It'll just wow. tear them apart. There's a lot of good beneficial insects. If we don't use a lot of insecticide in the garden, we can really build up good numbers of these insects. Good, so, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah good. Okay. The, so, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say the next thing is protecting the fruit. Okay. So we're, we have a plant, we've got good size on it, it's flowering. There's lots of different caterpillars that okay. will lay eggs on, on the fruit or on the leaves nearby. The, probably the big one you see is the, is the uh, tomato or tobacco hornworm. Uh -huh. And they have the little tail looking thing yeah. at the tail end. <laughs> and these caterpillars will get several inches long when full size. And often you don't see them when they're small, they kind of camouflage. Yeah. One time, uh, not too long ago, I, I had tomatoes on my deck and guess what? We had corn earworms, we had hornworms, we had yellow striped army worms, we had southern army worms. There's a whole bunch of caterpillars. And all of this you said was in the city. Yeah, right? this was this right in city. suburbia right. Right. And, and they they find your plants. Mm -hmm. So the, the moths are out at night, they lay their eggs on the leaves of the plant or on the fruit and then they hatch out in a, in a couple days and those caterpillars might feed for a couple weeks. Wow. So when they're tiny, they don't do that much damage, but maybe by the time they get an inch long, when they're about a fourth or fifth instar or, or stage, yeah. they can do a lot of feeding da damage. For sure. Yeah. So uh, usually you can pick off, if you just have a few plants, mm -hmm. you can pick them off every day, but you have to be out there almost every day because they can <laughs> do a lot of damage uh -huh. and they're hard to see. Uh, insecticides can be used. One of the safer products for caterpillars is BT. Yes. It stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. 
It's a bacterial toxin. It's very safe for humans to be around and pets, but it's very toxic to caterpillars. It paralyzes their midgut. Uh. And then they stop feeding yeah. almost immediately and then they soon die. But it won't hurt your beneficial insects, Good. your lady Good beetles, surfed flies, and other things. Okay. Green lace wings, for instance. So BT is one of the safer things for gardeners to use. We have a publication, uh, uh, UT Extension Publications, it's called You Can Control Garden Insects. You might want to check that out it is a good online. Yeah, it has, it has some pictures of what the insects look for and also control recommendations. Okay. And also some on the beneficial insects. Doc, we're glad you're here. That's good stuff. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. We can tell you love this stuff. Oh, it's great. <laughs> What's better? There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Joellen, let's talk about lilies. Lilies, All right. yes. So what do we need to know about lilies? They're beautiful, by the well, way. Well, like the iris beautiful. we talked about before, but they, they have gorgeous, mm -hmm. large blooms, mm -hmm. very showy in the landscape. Yes. And in bouquets, and you see them at, uh, in weddings and uh -huh. all in uh, flower arrangements all the time. Yes. Very showy. I, one of my favorite flowers because really? of that. I just I just love them. Yeah, I have a lot at home. <coughs> yeah, I just love love the colors. And too. I've I've planted a lot of them and, and enjoyed a lot of them over the years. Do. But there, we're going to talk about a few that do well in the mid south area. Okay. Sure. In fact, we have great at uh, this tarp this area and the area around uh, Tennessee and Zone Seven. Uh, one of the greatest areas for lilies to grow in the ground. Okay. So we need to take advantage of that. Man, by all means. The first one that we're going to talk about is the Asiatic lily, yeah. which is the ones you see in these yeah. containers right here. And then you can find them very easily in, in, in uh, garden centers. You know, they come in, in, in containers or they have them in, in bags that you can buy and plant yourself. Mm -hmm. um, very easy to grow, very readily available. And so they come in lots of colors and sizes, mm -hmm. you can see. I mean, they're just gorgeous. Uh, now, if you want to cut them and bring them inside, you see the, the uh, pollen on the ends here, there, that is stains really, really badly. So oh. if you're bringing them inside, if you're putting them in a bouquet, it's nice to just take your fingers and, and get rid of them, just huh. pull them off, okay. and then they won't have that uh, dark staining everywhere on your clothes or anything nice. else. But uh, otherwise, it is pretty on the flower. I like it. Nice. Uh, well, that's the Asiatic lilies and their hybrids. Uh, there's one called, we're going to go from the earliest blooming ones to the latest blooming ones, which is Lilium candidum, which is the Madonna lily. Madonna. It oh. blooms <laughs> in the fall, and it's only white, and it's very, very fragrant. Yeah. So that's a good one to in have the fall, for the, in, in, the in the fall. The, so okay. see, you have lots of lilies that bloom almost all summer long. Yeah, that's good. Uh, then there's Lilium formosanum, the uh, Formosa lily. Okay. Uh, it blooms in the summer, uh, usually June, July, and but it can be six to seven feet tall. Wow. Yeah, so got to leave some room for these. Um, then there's the one that you see everywhere. In fact, it is brought over from uh, Asia, and, but it has naturalized in North America, and that's the tiger mm -hmm. lily, Lilium lancifolium. And that's a beautiful one to have in your yard. It will naturalize, it'll do very well. But it has smaller flowers than these, but they usually hang down. Mm. And they're orange with little black spots that. on them. Mm -hmm. So probably people have noticed it in the landscape more, I mean, out, out in nature than they have in their own yards, but do very well. And there are other colors they've developed for that too. Okay. And before you go even further, uh, mm -hmm. naturalize, you use yes. the term. What does yeah. that mean? That means that it has escaped okay. and it has gone and it is, you can see them in ditches and around in, uh, uh, on nature walks okay. in the Good woods. They, they, they like that. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, then there is the Easter lily. Yeah. And it has its own, it's longiflorum and it's hybrids. Now we see them blooming at Easter uh -huh. and it's a trumpet lily because it has a long stem that looks mm. like a trumpet. And there's lots of those trumpet lilies, but the Easter lily is one yeah. that, you know, you can plant it in your yard and it will grow here and come back and bloom the next year in June. In June. Right. So it's, it, it works really well. Okay. Okay. Um, 
of course, of all the trumpet uh, lilies, the, the one that is most popular is called Regal. And it has maroon on the back side of it and white on the inside. Oh, wow. And so, and, it's, and of course, it's very tall. It's six, seven feet tall. So very regal plant. Okay. And then you've got the oriental lilies. The oriental lilies are more sturdy than the Asiatic and the trumpets. And they have done a cross. Of course, the most famous one of these oriental ones is the stargazer. Okay. okay. And you see that at the florist all uh -huh. the time. Okay. Um, it's pink and then it has uh -huh, the white uh -huh. edges on them, okay. very popular. Uh, but they've crossed the, the oriental lily with trumpet lilies and they call them Orion pets. Orion pets. Yes, <laughs> oriental and trumpets. Pets. So uh, Orion, Orion pets. pets. Right. Yes. Okay. And so they are much sturdier and there's a lot of different colors and, okay. and types of <laughs> those too. Um, but what do they like to do? Where, where do they like to grow? They hmm. like sun. Full sun, right? Like full sun, they oh. like a partly shady area. Oh, okay. Um, but they like well-drained soil, and, and, ah. and they do not like wet soil. So if you're having problems with them for diseases or insects or anything, and maybe the environment that you have them in, give them room. Don't bunch them up close together. Give them some space so the air can move between them. Okay. Because you don't want the botrytis, the leaf ah. disease that gets on them. Good. Because uh, the, the, if you have that, you can preventively spray that the next year with a fungicide. Okay. But, you know, environment is probably the best key to be having success with the lilies. Okay. Is give them enough space, don't crowd them. Space, well-drained soils. And well-drained soils. Yes, now, and when you buy them like this, just remember that lilies are a bulb, but they don't have the papery covering on them like mm. a, a normal bulb would. So that means the outside dries out very fast, and mm. you don't want that to dry out because that's part of the bulb that is going to grow. Okay. So when you get these, plant them as soon as you get them and try to keep them moist. Okay. And they do reproduce by, you know, the bulbs just keep getting more and more on each side, but sometimes they have little spots on the end called imbricate bulbs uh, that, that come on the leaves, and you can take those off and they'll reproduce by that oh, so they'll all too. Yeah, okay. they're, they're very that. interesting. Um, there is one insect problem that they have, and that's the red lily beetle. Mm -hmm. Now, the red, I have never seen that here on my lilies, yeah, but wow. apparently it lives its entire life cycle on a lily. So you're, you're gonna see eggs, or you're gonna see the bug itself, or you're gonna see its nymph stages, but they say the best way to control it is with neem oil on the nymph stage. Nymph stage, okay. Yeah, and, and you can use insecticides too, but there, it's pretty easy to control with neem oil if you want to, if you see them, but okay. you just, just inspect But often. you haven't seen. I've I, never I, seen them here. Okay. So, but, but they say Not they're a, a problem but I'd, I've never seen them. Okay. In fact, the only trouble that I keep having, which is why I bought me some more, is that the voles ah. like to eat the bulbs. Okay. So now that I've got these new, new lilies that I want to plant uh -huh. in my yard, I am thinking of getting a wire cage and planting them in a wire yeah, cage to keep the voles. Yes, with the I'm going right. to make a wire cage to plant them in so okay. that the voles can't get to uh -huh. them. Smart, smart. Mm -hmm. yeah, didn't realize I had that problem with voles. I need to pay a little bit more attention to mine. All right. <laughs> okay. But I, I do like the lilies, though, because they're, 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 they're easy. They're not difficult. They're no. Uh-uh. Huh. I've never had any problems with them. I've just enjoyed them. Good deal. Well, we appreciate that, Joel. Mm -hmm. Buy more lilies, folks. Buy more lilies. Right, you enjoy They're beautiful. That. They're beautiful. Thank you again. Good stuff. Here we are in the butterfly garden since we've trimmed it and notice that all of the parsley and the uh, oregano is starting to bloom and attracting bugs. We've got the butterfly weed that's starting to bloom and we have some uh, rudbeckia that's coming back and getting ready to bloom. We're going to add our annuals to all of this. This year we'll be adding some white and purple petunias to attract butterflies and bees. As always, we're going to be putting zinnias in because this is a nice flat surface that butterflies like to land on and get nectar. We also have lantana like we did last year. Butterflies love lantana. And we have some smaller zinnias that are of kind of an orangey red color that we'll use to fill in. 
And we will also be putting our sand and water back in for where the butterflies can come get a drink. All right, we've finished planting all the annuals to attract the butterflies and the bees. And when these uh, herbs get finished blooming, we'll trim them back. All right, so here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready for these questions? These are real good questions. We're yes. ready. You ready? All right. Here's our first <laughs> viewer email. How do I keep the cutworms out of my squash? It seems every year I get the squash growing only to be killed by cutworms. Thanks. And this is from Tommy from Chatsworth, Georgia. So Mr. Tommy, guess what? We have our etymologist here. Dr. Hill. So yeah. what do you say, Dr. Well, Hill? Well, we have cutworms, whether it's Tennessee or Georgia. Right. We have lots of them. <laughs> uh, the moth lays its eggs on weeds and such. Sure. The little caterpillars are nocturnal feeders. They, they hide during the day, then they come out at night and clip the plants. So we like yes. to, if you, just a simple thing you can do is just get a, um, uh, a toilet uh, paper roll. You can cut that <laughs> off and then wrap that with some aluminum foil and sort of fit that around oh, right. the base okay. of it. Yeah, yeah. If you want to add some diatomaceous earth within that ring or around it, that irritates the insects. They don't like that. Right. So that, that would help. Of course, insecticides can be applied. Since they're active at night, you do it in late afternoon to the soil around the base of the plant. Okay. Yeah. The toilet paper roll. How about that? That's good. Yeah, that's a pretty oh. good idea. Okay. See, there's... It's we got to conserve, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, right. is, that is good stuff. So there you have it, Mr. Tommy, uh, from our bug guy. So how about that? That's good stuff. All right, here's our next viewer email. My old magnolia tree loses a lot of leaves in the spring and has very few flowers during the summer. What does this very old tree need? And this is from Linda in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Ah. All right, so yeah, it's an old tree. So she says, old what tree. is this very old tree? because it's losing the leaves, Joella. Well, you know, I'm, I have a question about, a couple of questions. One is, uh, you know, it's old, but are the trees around it old also? So has it got more shade than it has had before? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's why it's not blooming as much. Okay. Um, is, is an older tree, um, maybe it, it needs nutrients. A lot of older trees benefit from deep root feedings. Uh, so, you know, but you would have to get somebody to do that sure. that has the kind of equipment a that you can do that. Operist. Yes, a certified That's arborist not. would have that. Okay. Um, then, you know, just keep it as healthy as you possibly can because uh, if you see no other signs of decline, I mean, maybe it just isn't a natural decline of that particular sure. tree, but trying to make it as healthy as possible is probably the best bet. Okay. Do you want to add to that, Doc? Well, Southern Magnolia is evergreen. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be casting off old right. leaves. Right. So okay. just, you know, just uh, if, you, if they're objectionable to you, get a rake, rake some <laughs> out. Right. Uh, if you have dead branches that are some dieback, prune them properly yes. and just let a little air in there. And uh, I think they should be fine. I think you're right about the sunshine and blooming. They might need more, more sunlight. So right, you're right. Because you don't have a picture shady. to see, you know, yeah. where this tree is because mm -hmm. it might be shaded out. But it's still a wonderful tree whether yes. it blooms a lot or not. That's right. Very good. Yeah. And it's actually the state tree for Mississippi. So there you go, Miss Linda. All right. Thank you for the question. Uh, here's our next viewer email. Can you please tell me what this is? And this is from Carolyn. So I think we know what that is. Yes. What is that? It's a uh, lily turf or lily monkey turf. grass. Yeah. Liriope. Liriope. Right? <laughs> yes. Liriope. Uh huh. A lot of people uh, plant liriope. Uh, Especially if they have areas, you know, that I, I've seen it in areas that are poorly drained. I've seen yes. it in areas that have bare spots. That's right. Uh, areas, you know, that uh, you know, soil is eroding. Um, mm -hmm. So you can pretty much grow it for. Yeah, and, and, it, and it does a great job everywhere. Right. Uh, sometimes some of the varieties are a little more aggressive, and yeah. that's probably escaped somewhere yeah. that she didn't want it. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with it, and it's some people either love it or hate it. Yeah, I know a lot of people that hate it. <laughs> Go ahead, Doc. Anything you want yeah. to add to that? <laughs> well, there's a little insect, a scale insect that sometimes gets on it. It oh, okay. attaches yeah. low down on the thing, but I don't think it hurts it a lot. But okay. occasionally you could apply a systemic insecticide to c control that if you had a problem with it. Okay. Uh, it might cause the, uh, it to look unthrifty, not grown as well yeah. as it should. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they do have a lot of foliar diseases too, but mm -hmm. yeah. that's why you, you 
the one thing about the what's called lily turf monkey grass is because you cut it once a year in February. Yes. And you get rid of and then you collect all of that and then get rid of it and then you don't have those diseases still hanging around right. to infect the plants for the next year. Because if you don't, they look all tattered and torn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good sanitation. Yeah. Yeah, you know, actually removing it from the garden. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's a good idea? <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> it's a good idea. All right, so there you have it, Miss Kayla. It's Liriope, or monkey grass. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so Joanna, Doc, we're out of time. It's been fun. That was quick. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. We need more questions. Keep, <laughs> keep, them keep them coming. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Thanks, Greg. All right, thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To get more information on tomatoes, squash, or lilies, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We have links to extension publications on these topics and many others. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.